just marvel sometimes at how God puts things together. And I don't know if you noticed the theme running through the song service this morning, but it was an awful lot about the work of Christ on the cross. And, you know, Morgan and I never sat down together before this, this day and talked about the themes. But the, the Spirit of the Lord knew what I had prepared and put the same theme on Morgan's heart this morning. I, I, it never ceases to amaze me how that happens. You see, God is so faithful and, and He loves us so much. And He desires us to understand what His Word says so that our hearts would be turned to Him, so that we draw close to Him. You know, we come to church for a variety of reasons. And, you know, I know a lot of you come here today and maybe you've had a hard week. Maybe you've had a lot of needs. But when we come here, we come here to bless the Lord. We come here to praise the Lord. We come here for the Lord. And in the meantime, God knows our hearts and He knows our needs and He knows everything about us. He knows our days. And He, he touches us by His Spirit. He touches us. You know, being a Christian isn't just rote tradition. It's all about relationship with our Heavenly Father. So, this morning, we're going to start into Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to be reading from verses 11 to 13. If you'd follow along with me. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So, when I read this passage, for many of us who've been brought up in the church on Christian principles and a basic understanding of theology, we understand some of the wording that I just read there in, that, in those verses and the principles the Apostle Paul uses. We understand what those are talking about. But for many non-Jews or people um, that the Bible refers to as Gentile, us, who are new in the faith or young in the faith or maybe who are seeking to understand what Christianity is, is, is really all about and, and that's why maybe you're here this morning. The meanings of these words that I just read to you in Ephesians 2, 11 to 13, they might sound unfamiliar, um, maybe a little bit strange, a little bit confusing. Well, if you're unfamiliar with the culture that was present in the first century A.D. in the area around Palestine, at the time when this letter was written, mention of uh, circumcision and other covenant promises in the Bible, as well as mention of um, the blood of Christ, well, it can bring certain word pictures that may not be the same as what the author here originally intended. And there's a major cultural gap between us here in the 21st century and the world of the first century church. And um, it can make understanding uh, why God made covenants with Israel very difficult. Well, I want to ask you this question. Now, there's talk in this passage about circumcision. Now, why is there so much ink in the Bible spent on the subject of circumcision? Well, when the Bible men mentions this ceremony of circumcision, in the modern day, many people's minds turn to hospitals, right? Turn to hospitals. There are current debates on whether circumcision is child abuse or not, things like that. But in the context with the teachings 
of Scripture here. Circumcision was a significant covenant that was made between the Israelites and God and, and the children of Abraham and God. Well, the concept of covenants, um, it's one of the most important things for us to understand if we want to accurately decipher what the Bible is trying to say to us, what God is trying to say to us, and how God intends us to live out our faith. Now, a covenant in Bible times is similar to what in the modern world here we would call a contract, a treaty, or a, a will. Very similar. Each covenant established the basis of a relationship, conditions of that relationship, so the relationship, the conditions of that relationship, and the promises of the relationship and the blessings that would follow if that covenant was obeyed, and the consequences if the conditions of that covenant were unmet. So to us, I mean, we look at covenant. When you think of covenant in the modern day here in North America, you know, one of the most familiar examples of a covenant would be the covenant of marriage where you take your vows and you have a covenant between a man and a woman and you, you become one and you become a family. That's an example of a covenant. And from a broad perspective, covenants provide, I guess they, you could say they provide the skeletal framework for how the whole story of the Bible is woven together. Covenants are mentioned throughout Scripture. And as the Bible story unfolds, we see God making covenants with different people. Now he see him keeping his covenants, fulfilling his promises concerning that covenant. And uh, he also, we also see where man um, breaks the covenant of God. And it's through the covenants of the Bible that God unveils his plan for the redemption of fallen man. Now, there's many different kinds of covenants, but six are crucial to the understanding of the Bible and God's plan of salvation, redemption for humanity. Six are crucial. Six, the six covenants that are crucial are as follows. The covenant that God made with Adam and Eve in the beginning. The first one. The second one was the covenant that God made with Noah after the world was destroyed by flood. The third was the covenant that God made with Abraham. The fourth is the covenant God made with Moses. And the fifth is the covenant that God made with David. And finally, the covenant that God made to the believers in the New Testament. So, we look at this covenant of circumcision. Now, that's part of the covenant that God made with Abraham. We find the, the mention of circumcision in Genesis chapter 17. And when Abraham was 90 years old, he went from the land of uh, Ur of the Chaldeans to a new land, the land of promise, the land of Canaan. And when he arrived in the land of Canaan, God made a covenant with Abraham. Abraham listened to God and left his home and went on the urging of God to go to this land. He obeyed God. And when he arrived in that land, God asked Abraham, and you see this story in Genesis 17, to look around, to look at this land. And he told Abraham that he would be the father of of many nations, and that his descendants would be as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Now, Abraham at that time had no son. He's 90 years old. But God promised him, I'm going to make you the father of many nations, and your descendants are going to be like the sand on the seashore. And as a sign of this blessing, that was a blessing that God pronounced, blessing of fruit, between him and his wife of a family, and a family that would reproduce and fill the earth. 
as a sign of blessing, Abraham was told, and this is part of that covenant, he was told that every male among him, including himself, would need to undergo circumcision. And after this, whenever a male child in their family was eight days old, that male was to be circumcised. So, why circumcision? Why not a tattoo on the back of your head or, you know, on your toe or something like that? I don't... You see, there's reasons why God does things. You see, God promised Abraham many, 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 many grandchildren. Okay? The relationship between him and Sarah was to produce that. So, God promised fruitfulness in his reproductive life with his wife. And, in other words, circumcision as a sign that his male organ was to be marked in dedication to God for the reproduction of God, the offspring. Now, I know in the modern day, in our day, this is kind of weird, right? That's kind of a weird concept. But this is a mark that God wanted Abraham to have and his descendants to have to show that God was in charge of bearing fruitfulness in their families. Their children were a blessing from him and everything was about him. So Abraham would know that it wasn't his own making. His children would know it's not their own making. The families that they have and appreciate and love, we, we have children, we love them, right? We love our kids. Though, those children were not just there by chance. God had his hand upon them. God was involved with children and the children's children, and so on. God promised that Abraham's sexual union with his wife would be fruitful. And their future family would be set apart in the world as the Lord's ambassadors to the nations of the earth. Now, again, this is a concept that maybe we find foreign. But that's really what it comes down to. That's why circumcision. Okay? As Gentiles, we were not part of God's biological covenant with Abraham because he's not our biological grandfather. By nature, we didn't have a share in the promises made to Abraham's offspring. We are on the outside without Christ, excluded from citizenship with Israel. But long ago, see, God foreknew this. Long ago, a promise was made in Isaiah chapter 42 by God to the people of the earth. God promised that he would commission a savior who would establish a new covenant with his people and would be, he would be a light to the Gentile nations of the world. Now, I think it's good for us to read this prophecy. It applies to the point that Paul is trying to make here in Ephesians chapter 2 in our text concerning the work that Jesus did in making a way for Gentile peoples to be brought into relationship with him. In Isaiah 42, 1-7, we read, Here is my servant, whom I uphold. Talking about Jesus. My chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. He, a bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is what the Lord God says, the creator of the heavens who stretched them out who spread out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take a hold of your hand. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. 
You see, in the beginning, when Adam and Eve broke the covenant, the first covenant with God, not to eat from the fruit of that tree. When they broke that covenant to be obedient, okay? sin came into the world, into Adam and Eve, and all the family of people past that point. And God decreed to Adam and Eve in that covenant that if you eat from the tree, you will surely die. So the, the penalty of disobedience to God and sin is, is death. And death was brought through the broken covenant of Adam and Adam. And because all the people past Adam sinned, the whole population of the world has been living under a death penalty. The Lord decreed in Leviticus chapter 17, 11, For the life of a creature is in the blood. I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. In the Old Testament, the shedding of blood in sacrifices has a special significance. The sprinkled blood is a covering for sin, and the life of an animal in the Old Testament was poured out unto death as a substitute for the people to cover over sin. The animal's life was given on behalf of the life of the people. And judgment was carried out, transferring the sin of the people onto the animal sacrifice. And we have a whole bunch of ceremonies that were written in the law of Moses that the Israelites followed. And God also decreed that because of his great love for humanity, that he wasn't just going to leave uh, everyone with that system. He would run an intervention by fulfilling the prophecy that I just read to you in Isaiah chapter 42, by saving his people with this new covenant that he would bring, and also that he would reach out to the Gentiles of the world and rescue them from sin's penalty of darkness and death. So the prophecy of Isaiah came to pass when Jesus God the Son was sent by God the Father into the world as a child born of a virgin. He was without sin. And he would be the reconciler of humanity, and yet he was, he was able to reconcile with humanity, yet maintain his position as God. The Lord Jesus, he came. To open eyes that were blinded by the darkness. To set people free from their captivity to evil. And Jesus came to fulfill the law of Moses and all of its ceremonies. And to bring hope and salvation to the Gentiles. You know, when you look back at the start of the ministry of Jesus, we're given the picture that he was actually, um, before he started his earthly ministry, he went to John the Baptist to be baptized. And uh, as he was going down to see John, in John chapter 1, 29, we're, written, it, we're told in what's written, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, Jesus was God's sacrificial lamb. The blood of Jesus was shed to remove the wrath of of God from the believing sinner. The wonder of this is that God himself removes his own wrath by the sacrifice that he provides in himself. This is true love in action, my friends. This is, this is the basis for John 3, 16 and 17. God himself paid the price for the sin that we made. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. There's salvation in God. God is merciful, not willing 
that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he brought his Savior. He brought Jesus into the world. He came and clothed himself in flesh and became a human being so that he could die. Now, many people suggest there are different ways to come near to God. Some think by keeping God's law, living a good life by not harming anyone else, that you can come close to God. But the scriptures teach us that there is no way to come to God, no way to be brought near to Him outside of the blood of Jesus Christ. The life of the sinner is under death sentence until Christ, by the shedding of His blood and an application of that on the heart of a believer, releases and cleanses sin from that person. There's no other way. It's not about good, good systems of living. Yes, there's good systems of living. And it is about that. But that's not where it starts. That's a spin-off. A heart that's made pure before God and, and, and cleansed and, and lived in by the Holy Spirit naturally begins to live a life that is pleasing to God. It's, some people say, well, I, I, I can make my way. I, I, I'm good. I, I don't do things like the other guy does. There is, no, there is no forgiveness for sin without the shedding of blood. Who can say that they have not sinned, that are not a sinner? There's nobody. No one can say, I'm not a sinner. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not a sinner deserves to be in the presence of God. Because we're sinners. See, for the Jew, Jesus Christ is the sacrifice that perfectly fulfills all that is foreshadowed in the Levitical system through the law of Moses. He's the one sacrifice that removes all sin. All the sacrifices of animals beforehand, dimly foreshadow the perfect, fulfilled sacrifice in Christ. He did what animal sacrifices could never do. The blood of Christ cleans the soul from guilt. It doesn't just cover. It cleans. It cleanses the soul from guilt. So that when the blood of Christ is applied to the human heart, when God looks at you, He doesn't look at a sinful person anymore. He looks at His own righteousness. It's a gift. It's such a beautiful, beautiful, precious gift. Clear, clean. We don't deserve it. But nonetheless, he gives it. The whole Old Testament sacrifices find their fulfillment in the blood of Christ in his death. And in the New Testament, Jesus, the Son of God, who is God in the flesh, suffered the death penalty for the law that we deserved brought down on us. We deserve death. (laughs) I've said this many times and I'll say it again. Those who don't, who think they're good enough to make their way to God by by themselves, underestimate their own holiness. Or sorry, underestimate their own depravity. And (laughs) overestimate their own... Okay, let's try this again. Those people underestimate God's holiness and overestimate their own righteousness. Right? That's what, that's what it is. We underestimate God's holiness. God is not just a figure off on some bulletin board. He's not some figure in history. He's the living creator who spoke the existence of things into being. He is the all-powerful creator It's not just God. No, it's God, and everyone will fall before him and confess that he is Lord. If we don't do it here, we're going to do it in the future when we stand before him. We're going to fall before him and say that he's Lord. Isaiah, that scripture that I read, predicted that people from all over the world, the islands of the world, will put their trust in him. And Jesus came willingly to lay down his life as a sacrifice for the believing Jews and also for the Gentiles. 
This is good news for us Gentiles, eh? Isn't this good news? Even though we're foreigners to the covenant promises that were made to the Israelites, okay? this is good news. We can have grace and peace with God. God gives us grace and peace. The Jews were God's chosen people because of his grace alone, not because there was anything particularly special in them in and of themselves. Biologically, the Jews were part of that covenant with Abraham. But they had become proud in their position as God's chosen people and had developed an intense hatred for the Gentiles. So the scripture here is talking about reconciliation. The Jewish religious crowd of the day viewed Gentiles as uncircumcised dogs. That's how they viewed them. They shook their dust off the feet after traveling into Gentile territory before the coming back into their land. They didn't want to defile the land. They believed that Gentiles would defile them and their land. They would never eat with a Gentile. Even Gentile converts to Judaism had to keep their distance in the temple. And there was hostility. There was real hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles of that day. There still is some. Well, the source for host the hostility between Jews and Gentiles is the sin and of pride. It always has been the sin of pride that's at the core of racism. Anytime we elevate ourselves because of our race above another race, it's because of pride. And the Apostle Paul encourages the Gentiles here that although there has always been this hostility between the tribes of Gentiles and the tribes of the Jews, through Jesus, radical um, things are changing here. Radical things are changing. There is a laying aside of hostility. The laws of the Jews were all about purification and atonement. And God's work through the death of Jesus on the cross fulfilled the requirements of the law of Moses for them. Thus the Jews who put their faith in God's Messiah would be reconciled to God by faith in the Messiah. Paul says in verse 14 of our text, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. You want to see racism diminish? I do. You want to see racism diminish? A Christ-centered focus will scrub out a, race, a racist agenda. Racism is all about pride. Jesus is all about servanthood and humility. You want to see racism diminish? People turn to Jesus and really serve him and live for him. And that will go away. Now, it's not always what people see with Christianity, is it? That's because sometimes Christianity has been taken the wrong way. It's become a system rather than a relational uh, connection to God and to other people. You know, Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus, also paid for the sins of the Gentiles. We were foreigners to the covenant promises, but we too have received mercy from God through the same faith that saves the believing Jew. The sacrifice that Jesus made, the sacrifice that Jesus made, ended the need for further sacrifices, bringing peace between man and God and peace between man and other groups of people. Verse 15 of our text, by setting aside in his flesh the law with all of its commands, with its commands and its regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away. That's the Gentiles. And peace to those who are near. Well, that's the Jews. The same message was, you see, the same message was preached. 
to both groups. And it says in verse 18, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Now, if you remember the covenant with Abraham that was promised that he would be the father of many nations, the root of faith established by Abraham has become established like the roots of an olive tree in the planted earth. The Israelites grew out of that root and have become the native olive tree growing out of that root. But was valued by God, but what was valued by God in Abraham was not his bloodline or the physical DNA. That's not what the value was in. But the value was in the substance of faith that Abraham had. That was the value. It was written in Genesis 15, 6 that Abraham, Abram says, believe the Lord. This is before he was given the name Abraham. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So are you following what I'm trying to get at here? Abraham became the patriarch of faith for all who believed in the one true and living God. Israel is at the center of God's plan for redemption of mankind. God planned that Israel would come from Abraham biologically, and Israel was chosen to be the seed through which God would bring his Savior into the world. He was the one, he is the one to whom all the Jewish law and prophets point. The seed to follow Abraham, the fulfillment of the promise was in the Messiah, in Jesus Christ. Now, it's like an olive tree, right? They're part of that. They mark themselves with circumcision to remind themselves that they had a covenant with God and that they were his children. That was passed on from generation to generation. It was an outward sign of an inward reality of this covenant. But God desires more than a physical mark on people. He desires not just a physical mark, but a mark on the heart. A circumcision of the heart, you might say. Where everything that we do, our families, our, our blessings that come from our families... That all comes from God and a recognition of the heart um, bowing to the authority of the living God. That is, that is what God desires. In another passage of Scripture written by Paul to the Galatians, Paul writes, Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you, so those who rely on faith are blessed along with, what, with Abraham, the man of faith. See, by faith, God no longer makes a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Yes, there are covenant promises to the Jewish nation alone. I don't believe this, rela uh, this replacement theology that's going around. Okay? The Gentiles have been included, the believing Gentiles have been included into the tree of Israel, taking its nourishment from the root of Abraham. We're grafted in. God is able to take us who are naturally from wild olive trees to cut us off of our wild, uh, our wild roots and to take us and to graft us into his cultivated olive tree, where we take the nourishment from the root of faith that was in Abraham. So we grow along with the, the believing Jews as one in Christ. No distinction anymore. The Messiah did this. The word of God in our text today is that anyone... Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, male or female, white or black or brown or whatever color skin we are, quick-witted or slow, old or young, anyone can be a child of Abraham and inherit the blessings promised to Abraham's children if we live by faith in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul explains, 
proclaims this to the, the Gentiles. And I'll be closing in a few minutes here. But he, he excitedly proclaims this in, in verse 19. He says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners. He's speaking to us Gentiles. He's speaking to the Gentile believers in Ephesus. But it goes through the centuries to us too. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. What a powerful picture of the family of God. A building compromised of interlocking believers, just like stones are interlocked, building a stone building. The foundation is sure. Why? Because the cornerstone was set true. The direction was placed true and level and sturdy. And the foundation stones that were laid in the apostles on the prophet, which rest against the cornerstone, which is Christ, they find their bearings and they, and they, they make this building that is sturdy and strong. And all the believers in Jesus after that are, are like stones stacked upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, resting upon Christ as that chief cornerstone by which the whole building rises to become a place where God dwells. This is amazing. We don't see God in a cathedral or in this building. The, the presence of God is in and among His people. We are the body of Christ. We are the building that is the church. One new man in Christ with a new covenant in His blood. The blood of Jesus is the cleansing solution. And that's what brought us near to God when we believed. Amen. So we're a house of faith. A place where God dwells in his Holy Spirit. Individually and corporately connected as we serve one another and serve God. Amen. Would you bow in prayer with me?